Amen. How are you doing? <clears throat> Good? You guys can be seated. You guys can be seated. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so my name is David. For those of you who may not know me, um, I think the last time you might have seen me teach was via a Zoom or YouTube screen. So um, it's good to be in the flesh, see you guys in the flesh, see you guys in person. Um, like Tambo said, I have known him a very long time. I won't tell you what he was like when I first met him, but uh, I'm joking. Uh, we both did meet in the house of the Lord, um, thank God. Um, similar to uh, myself and the bishop of the house. I always call him bishop because he used to have a, a handle which was all about bishop. So he was always already being prophetic. Um, but it is, uh, it is great to be here. Um, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm a Spurs fan, so I thought my invite was going to be... <laughs> just, I'm just going to get it out of there now. I, I was surprised that my invite still stood after how the season ended with um, our Arsenal fans. But anyway, it's all good. God is good. He's the God of order and unity. Um, we're going to get straight into it because I'm known to preach for a very, very long time. So I'm just going to try to keep it as short as possible. Um, respect the house, respect the time. But first and foremost, I want to pray. If that's all right? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's good. Father God, we give you praise and glory. We thank you that you are here. You are present with us um, in the form of your Holy Spirit who dwells on the inside of us. You have built us up in, to be your heavenly, your, your, your earthly temple. And that's, that's something that will continue to astound humanity for the rest of our existence, that you would choose to be here with us before we go to be with you. Um, it's an incredible truth that you desire intimacy above all things. And even as the word has already gone forth today, there was so much talk about intimacy, vulnerability, connection, community, all things which I know are close to your heart. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you afresh. You've been here from the start. You were waiting for us, actually, to, to come in and, and meet here. And I bring to remembrance the word you gave me back in 07, that this is the covenant you've made with me, that the word and the spirit you place upon me shall so not depart from my mouth or the mouth of my children or my children's children from henceforth now and forever. Amen. So I thank you, Father, that, that that word is about to be realized and manifested in a new and a fresh way, um, even to astound myself. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So my title today um, is up here. Uh, the Centrality of Love. I know you're a note-taking family, so um, I'm going to do my best to kind of keep it in some sort of order. I do have a lot of scriptures. Some of them I may just mention. Okay, if you do, uh, if you miss one, please feel free to come back to me. I've got them all written down. Um, I'll be here for the next week as well. I'm here next week. Um, <laughs> Currently, next week has a different title, but we'll see how today goes um, before we move on. The centrality of love. Um, the main scripture that we will anchor around is John 17, 26. Um, just for a bit of context, John 17, I, I traditionally use it as the actual Lord's Prayer. Okay? Now, if I said to you, give me the Lord's Prayer, what would you go for? You are in heaven. Okay, we don't need to go through the whole thing. <laughs> like I said, I'm going to try to be quick. <laughs> but yeah, we, we know it. We've said it in school, maybe. You maybe went to a Catholic school, you had to say it twice a day, whatever the case is. I don't know what it is. But in that, um, in that, that, that prayer that he gives the disciples, he says, Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those. Okay? Now, Jesus had no sin. So Jesus would never have prayed that prayer. So it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer, if anything, because if you look at the verse before it, it says, Rabbi, teach us how to pray. So he gave them the prayer that they could pray, but not the prayer that he would ever pray. It's so very interesting in that. So when you see, and Jesus began to pray, and there's actually words, John 17, that's an insight into how it would have sounded when Jesus prayed. Well, that wasn't even in my notes. <laughs> what am I doing so like I said can we just have that scripture just briefly we're going to come back to this I have revealed to them who you are I'll continue to make you even more real to them 
so that they may experience the same endless love that you have for me for your love and I live in them even as I live in them okay that's in the passion translation um, I'm very much an amplified and um, translation fan so I will be reading from that for the most part I have a question for you guys I'm a teacher by trade um, so this set out was really good for me I can move about I can engage um, but what is the starting point of the gospel story that's actually where does the gospel story start what would your answer be just give me some answers the birth of Jesus the birth of Jesus any other answers on that creation, creation. okay anything else no? Yeah. Guys, don't be scared. <laughs> I don't know what your experience was in school, but I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm not that guy. So we've got creation, the birth of Jesus. Where's the gospel story for you? Where does it start? It might be just personal for you. Maybe it starts in Eden with, with Adam and, and the fall of... David. David, okay. The Old Testament. Old Testament. Okay, some good answers there. Some good answers. The first scripture I'm just going to check in with you with is 1 Peter 1. And it's 19 to 20. And it says, But you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah, like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish or spot. It is true that he was chosen and foreordained, destined and foreknown for it, before the foundation of the world. But he was brought out to public view, made manifest in these last days at the end times for the sake of you. So it says there about the, the Lamb of God was, was foreordained before the foundations of the world. Okay? I'm going to back it up. They always say when you're, when you're preaching, you should always have two scriptures to prove a point. And the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. Okay, so Ephesians. This is Paul writing Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 5. And it says here, May blessing be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Even as in his love he chose, he actually picked us out for himself as his own, in Christ, what does it say here? Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy consecrating and set apart for him and blameless in his sight even above reproach before him in love why? verse 5 for he foreordained us destined us planned in love for us what a phrase he planned in love for us right? if you've got daily meditations daily sayings that you say I was planned in love incredible he was planned in love for us to be adopted, revealed as his own children through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the purpose of his will, because it pleased him and it was his kind intent. So what is the starting point of the gospel story? We had creation, Old Testament. It says here, before the foundation of the world. So the gospel story, okay, our salvation and our identity in Christ starts the actual idea of it started before the world was even created when did adam sin after the world was created now i don't have all the theological juice to be able to explain how it works but it talks about christ was crucified before the foundation of the world so if the gospel story is all about christ being crucified and we see it at calvary in matthew 27 but we also hear this talk about something happening before the foundation of the world. It shows me that what showed up first, his love or my sin? His love. So what's the starting point of the gospel? His love. The love of God is the starting point of life itself. The centrality of love, okay? And what I'm trying to prove and what I'm trying to share with you guys today is how love was before. Is it, it came before you existed. It brought you into existence. And it propels your existence. So it came before. It birthed. And it propels. Okay? So we have this revelation in the scriptures hidden. 
It's not very commonly spoken about. We talk about Calvary and Golgotha and then everything that took place. The Passion Week. <clears throat> talk about salvation. If you pray a prayer or say this, say that, whatever. But it's not very often spoken about this pre-existence. That before the world came to be, God was. We have an inclination of this in John 1. Okay? So in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Okay? It begins to talk about how the world, um, in Hebrews 11, verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the world was framed and fashioned and equipped for its intended purpose by the word of God. So there's this pre-existence, before Eden, before Adam and Eve showed up, before we showed up on the scene, there was already a pre-existence going on. Now, there's many things that God is referred to in Scripture. But one of the key things, and probably the main thing I would say, and I submit to you, is that God is love. It is not an extension of himself. It's not a choice that he has to make. It literally is who he is. So therefore, he cannot deny himself in his expression of love. So in Ephesians, when it tells us that we are his, uh, his masterpiece, or in some translations, his handiwork, in the Greek, it's the word poema, from which we get poem. We are his poem, formed and fashioned for the works of God, that we may walk in them. So everything about our existence starts before creation. Which is why it makes sense to me in Genesis 1.26, where he would say to himself, I'll explain that in a minute, let us make man in our own image. Who was the Father speaking to in that? Holy Spirit, Spirit, Christ, okay, so we have the Trinity. So he says, let us make man in our own image. We've already established that God is love and that that love existed. Remember, it says we were planned in love before the foundation of the world. So if his love existed before my sin... It is unfair for me to build my life and my identity of anything to do with my sin when his love came first. It was commonly taught over the past 2,000 years that, uh, that the cross, that Calvary, was a response to the sin of man. But that's a lie. If he was crucified before the foundation of the world, then it's not a response. It was a plan. It had already been put into motion that we would be saved. I, I, I love the, the braggadociousness of God. I say this all the time. It's like, when you, when you stumble on these things, I always feel like God just has a little... <laughs> <laughs> you just figured it out. <laughs> you know, because he, he's so smart that he knew, I am about to create something from the dust. In my own image. But I'm also going to give it choice. And if in that choice, it decides to go in a particular direction, I need to have a plan. My plan is salvation. My plan is the biggest and most um, scandalous expression of love you can ever imagine, that the father would allow his son to be murdered. Okay, I always refer to Calvary. When Christ spread those arms on, on that hill, it was the greatest marriage proposal you've ever witnessed. It was him saying, you, me, let's get married. Let's do life together. The only way to do that is I have to take away this sin question. So when we talk about the gospel, let's be true to its roots. Let's, when we're sharing with people the gospel story, just on a practical level, let's start where it starts, which is the love of God. It's not really about your sin. Your sin is a footnote in the story because the love of God has been consistent for all of eternity. So the sin part is just, it's 4,000 years. Because when Christ came, what did John say? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all sin has the potential to be taken away because of Christ. So really, we're only looking about four to 6,000 years worth of sin reigning in this world. So if that is the case, is it fair for me to preach a gospel based on 6,000 years as opposed to eternity? It's unfair. And we wonder why the church doesn't grow. Because we're pulling people in with something that was temporary as opposed to that which was eternal. And that which was eternal is the love of God. 
So, in Galatians 3... <laughs> like I said, it's, it's clear from the pre-existence of Christ that the starting point of the gospel story is the love of God. Galatians 3, 7 to 8. I'll read it for you. Um, it speaks about... Actually, I'm not going to read it. It just basically it speaks about how the gospel was preached to Abraham. Incredible. So the father shows up. The father and Abraham used to have some really good chats. Read it from Genesis 15 all the way through. Some really good talks. And it talks about how the father preached the gospel to Abraham. So we've already established the gospel is rooted in the love of God. So what was the message that was preached to Abraham? The love of God. It was preached to Abraham, the love of God, or you can maybe even say the goodness of God. Is it therefore a surprise that the greatest example of faith that we have in Scripture is the one who had the revelation of the love of God? Because it's quite easy to believe and to trust a God who is eternally good. If Abraham walked into life thinking that Yahweh was like the other gods that he'd been around when he grew up, it's quite interesting to note the culture that Abraham came from was known for its child sacrifice. Wow. So when Yahweh turns up in Genesis 18, I think it is, um, it's not 18, it's 22, I think, and he says, there you go. <laughs> Don't let no erroneous teaching come out here. <laughs> when, 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 when Yahweh shows up and says, hey, I want you to offer up your son as a sacrifice, He's speaking the language that Abraham once knew. And when he gets to the top of the mountain and he's ready to place that knife in his son and he sees there's a ram in a thicket and the angel says, stay your hand, the Lord has provided. What he took was the language that he knew and brought into a new revelation. But what, listen, listen to this, Abraham was preparing to sacrifice his son. He was mimicking that which the father had already done in eternity. Because the Lord will never ask you to do something he ain't going to do first. You're never going to be able to out-sacrifice God. I, you know, we, we laugh. But when he asks you to lay down that relationship, you have questions. But before the foundation of the world, his son had been sacrificed. He will never ask you to sacrifice anything more than he's already been prepared to lay down. And if the scripture is true and he has laid down his son already, man, what can we say to these things? So the gospel is preached to Abraham and then he becomes a man of faith. Romans 4.20 talks about it. It says, um, he stumbled not at the promises of God, but remained strong in faith, giving glory to God. If you read it backwards, giving glory to God, he remained strong in faith and stumbled not at the promises of God. It's a very interesting scripture. It describes how Abraham lived his life. And we see him. We know him as a man of faith. I'm going to dip into Ephesians 2. Like I said, guys, loads of scriptures, but I'm here for two weeks, so you'll forgive me. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 5. We're just backing up this. I'm just laying the foundation for now. Uh, verse 4, it says, But God... So rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace that you are saved, delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. So it says, because of, the reason why, the reason why he made us alive was because of the great, wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. Can you answer me this question? Where is your sin in that equation? Doesn't even mention. Doesn't even say, because of your great sin, I had to go and do this. No, 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 no. Because of the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. Again, 
if you have daily meditations, that's something you can confess over yourself. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, there is a great and wonderful and intense love of which he loves me. Okay, these are things that I have adopted into my life. It will change your life. When you realize that the whole reason why we're here today is not because there was a sin problem. It was because there was a love problem. His love was being extended and because of sin, it couldn't be reciprocated. So he came in the form of Christ, took away the sin problem and all of a sudden now, the great, wonderful and intense love can be shunned towards you and then you can go back. So there's a two-way relationship. All the problems in the world can be solved by love. I said this to my year six in the assembly on Friday. I said every single problem in the world can be solved with love. Trace it all back. If there was love in that equation, if there was especially the love of God, bam. We wouldn't have no issues. Okay? So it's interesting to note, again, like we, like we said, his, his love existed before sin. And our only entry into the conversation comes because of the love of God. Okay? So now the question shifts. Now that we have established that the love came first and he is the God who is love and he loves us with this great, wonderful, intense love. How good is God? Because if I say to you God is good all the time time, but do you really believe it? All the time. How good is God? I was on the motorway yesterday. Um, I already had this analogy in my notes, but I was on the motorway yesterday. And let me just speak to some of the drivers in the room. Um, Actually, it's just common sense. I'm in the middle lane, okay? I'm in the middle lane. Let's just, for some, it's a straight, let's say straight 82 miles, M40, come down from Birmingham, okay? Driving. If I was to go to the right, by half an inch, what would happen to me after a certain amount of time? You drift off to the right. Would it be perceptible at the beginning? But by the end, and there will be an end, (laughs) if you know how fast I was driving, but anyway, there will be an end. I can start in the middle lane, and if I turn my wheel, just, it just needs to be half an inch. Doesn't need to be anything major, just a little bit off, over time, I'll end up in that barrier. I'll end up in the wrong lane, and if I keep going, not just in the wrong lane, I'll end up in the barrier, no more David, no more next week. Sad. Okay? Bear that in mind. Lord forbid, yeah. Don't worry, I'm not going on the motorway next week. <laughs> this is why perspective is key. Because should you have an ounce of erroneous perspective, we're off. This is why the message of God, that God is good has been attacked for so long. Because the enemy knows if there would be a people group, if there would be a bunch of creatives who would be fully persuaded that God is good. Oh boy. Because it only took 12 to change the world the first time. How many have we got in here? More than 12. So what levels of, of influence can be reached by the one who is fully persuaded God is good. Right? So he's attacked that message from the start. He's attacked the message that God is good. That's why to Eve he said, come on. I'm paraphrasing. But he's like, come, did God really say? Maybe he just doesn't want you to... He questioned God's goodness and in the questioning um, oh, maybe... She reaches, takes the fruit, and here we are. Okay? The question wasn't about whether she was hungry or not. The question was about the goodness of God. There were so many trees in the garden that she could have eaten from. But he questioned the one that that seemingly had a barrier to the goodness of God. But it's interesting because he said, if you eat of this, you'll be like God. Genesis 1.26, made in the image and likeness of God. So he questioned something that was already true. But if she doesn't know it, and if it's not a revelation that she lives with every single day, 
I can come and question it, and you go, oh, maybe it's... Uh, da, 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 da. And all of a sudden, you're hitting the barrier. Okay? All of a sudden. All of a sudden, all of Christendom hits barriers. When um, No Longer Slaves came out, um, I remember speaking with the songwriters, and I said to them, we were on the road together, and I said, you don't realise how much of an anthem that song is because it's resetting the parameters of our expectation of his goodness. That's good. Okay? It was getting rid of the fear element. The first thing that Adam did was hide. So that song was attacking the very first thing that man in this sinful nature did, which was it caused him to fear. Okay? Throughout the course of human history, this is what I wrote in my notes. Uh, throughout the course of human history, the God that Adam met in Eden before the fall has been replaced by a bi bipolar, distant, unable to be pleased version. This unease has placed a barrier to entry in front of the abundant life that Jesus embodies and has promised us. And you know what? The barrier has a name. That name is religion. Okay, if you look through the course of human history, look in the Old Testament, it was mentioned today in 2 Corinthians 3, the Old Testament had a glory, but the, the, when the law was given, the reaction of the people was to shrink, shrink back in fear. And they said to Moses, yo, 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 you go up, we'll stay here, you just tell us what he says. Fear. When Adam hid, he took all of humanity into a place that we'd never been before because Adam had never had to hide because before the fall there was no question about the goodness of God so if there is no question about the goodness of God you will never hide and you will not taste fear I had to share a, um, in a theology lesson at work they invited me in I'm not a theology teacher but they, they hear me talk in the common room and <laughs> she was the head of the field was like, hey, it'd be really nice if the year 13 is here from you before they go to the exams. So what are you guys talking about? She gave me the topic um, about the church, about Christianity and secularism. Okay, cool. So I did a bit of studying for a couple of days and I walked in. And the statement that got the most attraction is when I said, I don't fear death. And the students came after me after, many of them Christian. Sir, what do you mean you don't fear death? I said, it is impossible for me to fear something that has already been conquered. That's so good. So I don't fear death. I will only go when it is my time to go. Yes. And I have been fully persuaded of this because I was a kid who feared death. Where I grew up wasn't a nice place. A lot of my friends didn't make it past certain ages. And so I had this fear of death, even in the kingdom. I still thought maybe something could happen and I'd be one of those statistics or an unfortunate story. But I don't fear death. And actually my belief is that I'm just going to go in my sleep. I've already said to the Lord, hey, 140, 150. <laughs> we'll do the Moses thing. You know what I mean? With that Moses gene. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's, I don't fear death. I don't fear failure. Why? Why would you fear if you know that God is good? When you know that God is good, there is no reason for any man, woman or child to hide. Okay? Which is why this perspective is key. Does he have a bad side? Right? How many times... Um, who's been in church longer than 10 years? 15? Okay, so we've all pretty much been in Sunday school at some point. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to check the age and the experience level in the building. Do you, do you remember when they used to try to scare us into getting saved? Uh. <laughs> Come on, guys. If you're in a car wreck, if you're in a car wreck and you haven't given your life to Christ, where would you end up? <laughs> what kind of anti-biblical foolishness is that now we thank God for our Sunday school teachers and our parents and whoever it was who said that to us. But that's not, that's not true. That's not how God works. 
we were given the bad side of God. We were taught about his wrath and his anger. He hates sin. I know he hates sin. I don't deny that. But the reason why he hates sin is because he's good. We were taught about God, the judge. But I love what Damon Thompson says. I think he actually got it from someone else. But the judgment of God is directed against anything that interferes with his love. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> Trust me, when I first heard it, I had to go back 10 seconds. <laughs> no, like you two double tap. The judgment of God yes. is directed at anything in your life which interferes with his love. That's why that relationship had to die. Because it was interfering with his love. That's why you might have lost that job. Because it was interfering with his, his love. Because you were placing that job as your provider when he should be your provider. So you know what, I'm going to have to take you out of that situation so you have nothing for a season so then your prayer life changes. Because you notice, when the bills need to get paid, <laughs> you pray very differently when the bank account doesn't have regular backs transfer. Okay? <laughs> the prayer goes up in intensity. But what are you laying hold of? You're laying hold of his goodness. Father, I know you, I'm your child. You can never let me fail. I love the scripture in Romans 10. I, I meditated on this once. I was doing a shift at New Look. This is when I was at uni, right? Them Christmas shifts. I hated it. I hated it. it was, and I, I was in Birmingham and it was cold, right? And I was on the front and I was like, could you just meet and greet? Oh, all right. <laughs> so it was freezing cold and you're in a New Look t-shirt and whatever. And I'll never forget, the Lord was like, why don't you meditate on the scripture? Because I'm here for two hours. And the scripture gave me was Romans 10, where it says, um, all who call upon the name of the Lord um, shall never be put to shame. I spent 45 minutes on the word never. Never be put to shame. You can look through all of history. Find me anyone who has called upon the name of the Lord. They have never. There is no record of my God failing. Can never be put to shame. So, if I am one of those who's called upon the name of the Lord, I will never be put to shame. To be put to shame will never occur to me. I'm just not one of those people. Oh, that means shame is far from me. I'm never even going to taste shame. Shame's shadow, can, as soon as it comes near me, has to flee. Why? Because I called upon the name of the Lord. You can understand how those two hours went. <laughs> But these are the things that he calls us to meditate on. Meditate on the goodness of God. Israel didn't, and that's why they became acquainted with his ways and not his nature. Okay? It's a whole other sermon for another time. Western theology um, started off well. Went, again, so Western theology started off well, uh, and then we hit the barrier. Okay? It produced a God in the image of man complete with mood swings and callous indifference, it meant that mankind focused more on what it could do to reach God than what God did to reach mankind. Okay? So we created a God which had this callous indifference. Okay, you're praying 10 times? Why not 11? You've read a couple of scriptures? Why not some more? We created a God who would say to us, you can't preach like him. Why not? How come you're not here in your career? It's not God. But those were the words that we heard that we attributed to God. And so we went and learned the 11th scripture. We went and tried to teach ourselves how to preach. And we did all these church things. And we got so addicted to churchianity that the Lord had to allow a pandemic to separate us from it. That's good. Let me tell you how. All of a sudden, it didn't matter whether you were head usher, Worship pastor, preacher, you're in your yard. Yeah. Forgive the colloquialism. <laughs> you're in your yard. Yeah. Doesn't matter who you are or what you used to do in church, there is no more doing. Just be. Yeah. Sit down and be. Because so I didn't ask for worship pastors. I didn't die for pastors and mega churches. I died for sons and daughters. 
And if you don't get that right, there will be no more mega churches. There will be no more pastors. There will be no more worship leaders. No, all of that will fade. When I, when I get to heaven, the Lord is not going to talk to me about how many tours I did, which worship leader I worked with, which song I wrote. He's not going to talk to me any of that. When I'm praying, he doesn't mention any of that stuff. He doesn't even call me David. He calls me son. Every single time. I'm in before him. The first word I hear from him is, son. Because that's the most important thing to him. Jesus arrives on the scene, right? Well, why did Jesus come? Anyone give me some answers? It's not a trick question. I know I've asked a lot of questions, isn't it? Some of you guys are like, oh, I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, this guy's... Why did Jesus come? Give me some answers. Die for our sins. Die for our sins. Well done. Anything else? To restore fellowship. To restore fellowship. My guy. Well done. <laughs> he's been tracking the notes. <laughs> like, oh, he's going there. He's going there. <laughs> Anything else? Restore fellowship to... To teach us love. To teach us love. Well done. All, all these answers are correct. Okay? And in doing this, right, in doing all three and more, he did one thing above all. He came to reveal the Father. Mm. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Can we have John 17, 26 up? Let's look at that scripture again. I have, this is him praying, right? This is him speaking to the Father, and it's just before he goes to the cross. And this is actually the last verse of that chapter. So the last thing he says before he wraps up his prayer is, I have revealed to them who you are. And I will continue to make you even more real to them. So that, this is why, this is why he revealed the Father. So that they may experience the same endless love that you have for me, for your love will now live in them, even as I live in them. If you go back a few verses, John 17, 22 is my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. And it says, this is Jesus praying again. He says, Father, the glory you've given to me, I now give to them that they may be one, even as we are one. Yeah. So it is not scandalous for me to say I am one with the Father, even as Jesus is one. Because yeah. he prayed it. Yeah. He said, even as, even as in them, my love will be in them, even as I will be in them. Cool. Father, Jesus' love is in me. And you love me the same way you love Christ. Sounds scandalous, doesn't it? It offends the Sunday school teaching that we heard. It offends the tradition of church that we've heard. It offends a lot. It offends our, man, our inner man that goes, really? And all of a sudden, the accuser stands from afar and goes, but what about last night? What about last week? What about last month? about what you said to Susie at the coffee machine at work? <laughs> you weren't so holy then, were you? <laughs> he says all those things. And my response is, Christ has revealed to me who the Father is, and he will continue to make the Father even more real to me so that I may experience the same endless love that the Father has for Christ. For the Father's love will now live in me even as Christ lives in me. I put myself in the scripture. That's, That's my response to the accuser. It's a statement of intent. Now, when Jesus prayed, do you reckon the father said yes or no? Yes. 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 So to that scripture is an eternal yes that can never be shaken, never be broken, never undermined. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday last week, last month, your conversation with Susie, doesn't matter how that went, whether it was left, right, up, down, whether you cussed her out or not, in the grand scale of things, he's already wrapped that moment into this prayer and his answer, which is yes. When it says in John 17, 22, that the same glory, what is the glory that Jesus walked in? John 1 explains it, it says, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. So the glory that Jesus walked in was so evident to John and others 
that they would look at him and go, he must be the son of God. That's the glory that Jesus says, I'm given to them. So that when they look at you, they say, you must be a son of God. You must be a child of God because you don't fear death. You said something earlier in your conversation that just really struck me. Yeah, I'm a Christian, that's why. You know, when I first came back to work, especially working in the school, oh, did you see the news? Did you see the stats? Did you see what? No, I didn't. Oh, do you not watch the bulletin? No, 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 no. Oh, how comes? That's, that's weird. <laughs> Put that thought the whole nation was watching the bulletin. <laughs> Maybe they were, just not me. And I said to them, I said, I'm a Christian. I, that's, not my, that's not my source. And I left it there. A few, few months later, some colleagues then came back to me. You know what you said about... So, so how does that affect you then? Well, I, I don't have any fear when it comes to this thing. You know, um, even before the pandemic, um, I, I remember one time... My friend, she had a big, she had a real bad cough. I said, well, you know, whatever. And I walked past her, she said, oh, don't come near, I've got, I've got something, I've got some lurgies. And I said to her, hey, I'm a Christian, if anything, that's going to go. That's good. Because I know who I am. I know what I carry. And I can stand in a room, and in one word, all sickness has to flee. Yeah. It doesn't, it actually does not matter. The, the rules have changed. It's an unfair advantage. <laughs> and it's always mine. <laughs> like, like, that's why it says stuff like, you know, more than conquerors. What's more than a conqueror? That's before we even start fighting, you're done. <laughs> like, th- that's why the Bible can be so bold and brash with its statements of intent. And you know, in Christ, all things of, what? All things. Yeah, all authority and power. All of them. What about, no, 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 all of it. It's all his. Oh, wow. Okay. So what about me? Yeah, yeah, you're in this as well. Jump in. What do I have to do? This is what Thomas, Thomas said to Jesus. Um, t- teach us, what, what, what do we have to do to, that we may do the works of God? <laughs> Jesus goes, just believe. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Because remember, he was coming from an Old Testament standpoint where you had to do in order to do. You had to do in order to be. Do you know one of the most unspoken of moments in scripture which shocked them to their core is the first time they heard Jesus pray. Okay? I'm going to set the scene for you. Twelve Hebrew boys, growing up, done the whole um, bar mitzvah. They know the Torah inside out, upwards, backwards, whatever. They know it like that. In the Old Testament, there were only four mentions of Yahweh as father and each one of them talked about him being the father of Israel okay let me set the scene so 12 boys <clears throat> let's say it's their evening meal Rabbi will you break the bread for us and bless the food yeah yeah Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it and he says a word so imagine all their eyes are closed and then he says Abba their eyes open. It was the first time in history on this planet anyone had referred to the father as father. And for the 12 Hebrew boys who knew all the scripture, knew all the prophecies, all the promises, because they had to. This was part of their maturation as Jewish young men. What? He just just said, Abba. What's he saying in that? He's saying, my father. Did you just call Elohim my father? Peter's looking at John. John's looking at Judas. Judas looking at James like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, are you for real? <laughs> Did you just hear that? No wonder they came to him and said, Rabbi, teach us how to pray. And what does he say? Our father. And they're like, oh, we can say it as well. <laughs> oh, what? And he was foreshadowing what was about to happen. When he went to the cross, the Bible says, Matthew 27, verse 50, that he cried out with a loud voice and gave up his life. Yeah. Verse 51 says, the rocks cried out, the ground shook, and the veil in the temple was torn into. So all of a sudden, 
it was possible for Peter to know Yahweh as Abba. And this is the centrality of life, of love, sorry. So love pre-existed, it chased us down and arrived in the form of Jesus. Jesus shows up and he reveals the Father for 33 years, even in the years that we don't know of. Just revealing the Father, just revealing the Father. And when he dies, all of a sudden it is possible for the life you now live to be birthed. And it's all because of the love of God. The love of a Father. Not just any old God. Not the distant God that we were taught about before. Not the one that we hide from when we sin. Not that God. I'm talking about the Father. The one who chases us down. Okay, I know people had issues with reckless love and the, the use of the word reckless. But I remember when I sat with the guys who wrote the song and I said, talk to me about the process of, of how did you even come up with that song? And they said, we had one thing we wanted to talk about. The love of God. And it was the only word that fit, but at the same time made us still have questions. Because every time you sing it, reckless, wild, untamed, passionate. We weren't taught to see the love of God like that. Before, it looked really, quite textbook. I love you, son. Yes, you did well today in school. Well done. You prayed, you read your Bible, tick, tick, tick. I love you. No, 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 no. The love of God, as seen in scripture, there's a thousand more scriptures we could go into. Zephaniah 3, 17, where it talks about he's leaping over us. Okay, he twirls. If you read it in the Hebrew, it talks about he twirls, he leaps, and he sings over us. Okay? And it's, it's written in the continuous present tense, which means it never stops. It's not conditional. It's not because you did something today that, was, that pleased him. Now he's going to jump and celebrate you. No, no, no. He did it anyway. Jesus came to reveal the Father. We see this in John 17. And in doing so, he uncovered, exposed, and began to attack the orphan spirit that had reigned supreme from the moment Adam hid from God in the garden. When Adam hid from the God who was eternally good, he induced humanity into a way of life governed by this orphan spirit. This is a spirit which denies its father, it sponsors its own endeavours, and fends for itself absent of God. The child of God says Jehovah Jireh. The orphan says, I am my provider. And I'm going to be honest, every single person here, myself included, has area or areas of their life where the orphan spirit still reigns. If there's an area where you struggle to trust God, that's where the orphan spirit is still trying to fight. So, how do you defeat it? You defeat it with a revelation of God's goodness. That's how Jesus came to defeat it. How do we know? The evidence is in the scripture. Jesus revealed the Father well. He did a really good job at it. And we see this with Peter. Okay? When Adam sinned, what did I say? What's the first thing he did when he sinned? He hid. Right? When he heard the approach of the Father, he hid. When Peter denied Christ, the next thing we see of Peter, okay, is when the women turn up and say, Christ has risen. What did Peter do? He ran towards. Jesus had revealed the Father so well and the revelation of his goodness was so entrenched in the disciples that where Adam hid when he heard that God was around, Peter, when he heard that Christ was around, ran towards so, and this is dealing with a sin question. Because Peter messed up. He lied. Said he didn't know him. Three times. You have three attempts. <laughs> Peter, who I now call Rock. You know, Peter who's seen the Lord transfigured. 
Peter, you've seen the sick healed, left, right, and centre. What did John say in the, in the back of his book? There was so much that Christ did, more than we could ever fit in all the books of the world. So what we get is the potted history. Right? So can you imagine? Peter's seen all this stuff for three years, and three times he denies Christ. Denies him three times, and his first response when he hears that Christ is around is to run towards him. Maybe it is true that Peter knew, okay, that we can boldly come before the throne of grace. Right? Our old pastor used to say, without fear, guilt, shame, or inferiority. Right? He used to pray every single time he used to pray. Without fear, guilt, shame, or inferiority. That's how we live our lives. But only if we have a revelation of the goodness of God. And that comes with a revelation of him as a father. I've got four scriptures I can give you. I'm not going to read them because of time. Uh, John 5.19. John 12.49. Matthew 11.27. And Hebrews 1. Two to three. Okay? These are four scriptures that you can use as part of your study about how Jesus revealed the Father. They talk about when Jesus says, you know, I do nothing except that which I've seen the Father do. So everything that Jesus did, every story you read was a representation and a copycat of the Father. Okay? However, turn to your neighbor and say, however. Since Jesus, the church has done its best to allow the orphan spirit back in. Corrupt theology, which was used to control the masses and subject them to a life of servitude without reward, led us to fearing being struck down in a car accident before we had a chance to repent. But, what does the scripture say? It is the goodness of God that leads to Repentance. Okay? And this is the message that Jesus preached. When you see repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying goodness. Goodness. Take a revelation of the goodness of God and repent. Because you can only repent when you have a revelation of the goodness of God. Now that's on a macro when it comes to terms of I'm a sinner, now I'm saved. And also on a micro, certain areas of your life that need repenting for, maybe mindsets that you need to repent for, maybe opportunities that you've taken that you know you shouldn't have, and now you're in a bit of a bind, you need to see the revelation of his goodness to lead you back to this place of repentance, where you can, repentance is the word metanoia, okay, it means to change your mind, right, it's not just to change your ways, you cannot change your ways without changing your mind, why, because as a man thinks, so he, there we go. So the fact that we even, again, the fact that we even taught repentance as changing your actions meant so many people ended up in sin cycles. They'd be good for six months and then they go back because we were trying to force them to change their actions before they were able to change their mindset, which comes from a change of heart. And the change of heart is I'm now awake to the goodness of God. And seeing that I know how good God is, I don't need to do that anymore. That's what repentance is like. That's what the disciples learn. The word of the Lord, right, if, if anyone's here in the prophetic, the word of the Lord to the earth right now is, I am good. Doesn't need to get any deeper than that. God is good. You can go out and say, yep, I've got a prophetic word today. This is the word of the Lord to the earth. God is good. And the response is, I am beloved. Until you are firmly established in your identity as the beloved, that's why I loved what my sister did with the prayer this morning. She preached half my notes. Okay? Let's talk about our sonship. Let's pray into our sonship. Let's establish that. Every single day, you should spend some time establishing your sonship. It probably, I would submit to you, is one of the most important aspects of your daily routine. 
because no matter what else happens that day, whether it's an utterly rubbish day or not, you're a son, you're a daughter of the Most High. And everything will be placed in that perspective as opposed to any other. And what do we say about perspective? Perspective is key. If I have the correct perspective, I'm not going to crash into any barriers. So there could be chaos all around me on the motorway. And at some point yesterday there was. There could be chaos all around. I'm going straight. And I'll reach my destination because I'm not, there is no error in my perception. Right? Which is why I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Written, you know that song was written about 10, 15 years ago? And they sang it at their school for years and then his wife was like, we might as well finish this. They finished it, put it together and now the whole world is singing it. But it was 10 years of sitting in, in, in a farm in, in the Carolinas. That's where they live, right? 10 years it sat being matured, 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 matured. So when they came to record it, it wasn't just a song, it was a way of life. So what you're responding to is not a song, it's a, it's a revelation. What is it that you've seen in the Father that you can say with such boldness, I am a child of God? And if you've ever seen them sing it live, <laughs> they are bold with it. She's going wild all over the place. <clears throat> not because it's a show or anything, but because she knows that she knows that she knows. When, when Jesus said, none can pluck you out of his hand, none can pluck you out of his hand. <coughs> when the scripture says that the Father has tattooed your name on his hand, the Father has tattooed his name on your hand. When he says that I am good and there is no shadow of turning, I am light, there is no darkness within me, he is light, there is no darkness within him. It's in James 1. Okay? These are the scriptures we need to obsess ourselves about. Obsess, and I use that word intentionally. Be obsessive about the goodness of God. Why? Because it's obsessive about you. How do I know? Psalms 23. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. It's chasing you down every day. So you chase it back. Every single day try to look for the goodness of God. Where, where are you? Where, there must be goodness here because I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. So the greatest revelation that's been poured out in this nation right now is the revelation of the Father. That's why we had to be in our houses, in our families for two years. Because then we realised, family is really important to me. So when we step back into church, we're not looking for church anymore. We're looking for family. And to have a family, there must be a revelation of the Father. Why? It says in the scripture, he is the father of lights from whom all fathers descend. So what he's doing now is building these communities, building these families around the revelation of him as a father. Because the father brings order to chaos. A father brings protection. This young man can run around without fear because his father's in the room. And mother. But for the purpose of the illustration, father okay there, there was a freedom and every so often you see him you saw it all, all morning it was blessing me because i knew what i was about to share <laughs> all, he, he, go, he does this just touch base right you're here you're still yeah you're looking at me right bang i'm off yeah. having the father present in your life doesn't limit your adventure yeah. as a christian especially as christian creatives the adventure is limitless because the father owns the playground our Father owns the playground. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Go create. That's what he said. Genesis 1, 27, I think. Go forth and multiply. Subdue the earth. We're going to talk about this hopefully next week, the DNA of creativity. Okay? Literally, go forth. Create. Why? Because I create, so you're going to create. Go, 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 go. And we're watching him. Is it okay? Yeah, it's safe. I got you. Is it okay? Yeah, it's safe. I got you. Adventure. Christianity is not boring. Yeah. It's adventurous. Yeah. Right. So we bring in, we, you know, this revelation of the Father has bring, brought to an end three things that the orphan spirit was releasing. Self-torment, okay, when we're always critiquing ourselves too much. 
self-preservation, when we're looking to make sure we survive, even though others, and maybe at the, uh, the expense of others, I've got to make sure I'm the one that gets that job. I've got to make sure I need 100 pounds more. Uh, self-preservation and self-harm. That's the end point of the orphan spirit, that we kill ourselves because we don't feel like we're good enough. For a God who has declared us to be good enough before the foundation of the world. Could you um, just play for a little bit? I'm going to end it here, but I do have a word that I wanted to share in this house, and I wanted to share it publicly. Um, I knew something was brewing all week. Brewing all week. And then last night on the motorway, God was like, here's what I wanted to say. Lord, I can't even write it down. <laughs> so I called my wife, and I was like, babe, take this down, take this down. So I want to share this word, and it's for Brother Ayo. Okay? So this is what the Lord said. I'm going to try not to get emotional, but I do have my tissues. He says this. I am opening up a revelation of fatherhood in and through you so much that this house will become a place that the orphan spirit reigns no more. You have often dreamed of this house being a harbour for shipwrecked creatives. I'm ready to call them in by establishing the flame of my love at the very centre of your existence. Now with my love comes an outpouring of my goodness, so much so that even while small in number, your story will be told around the world. Father, I'll give you praise and the glory. I know, yes, there is a baby on the way. Multiple in this house. And it's perfect timing. Four months ago when he said to me, can you do the 19th? Oh, Father's Day. Okay. And at the time, I didn't even know there was a baby on the way. But look what the Lord has done. That even in this house, you will see it firsthand what it means to have a father around. One, two, three, four, there's a few and some more on the way, I know, by the tosser and, you know. You will see fatherhood at work and everything you see, note it down because it is a copy of what the father has for you. It's not even the fullness. However quick Tambo goes to pick him up when he falls, the father's even quicker with you. Perfect. <laughs> right. right? However quick, the Lord is even quicker with you. Daddy, I'm hungry. Okay, let me go get some food. No, no, no. With the father, Daddy, I'm hungry. Here. My father has a cattle on a thousand hillsides. If he were hungry, he wouldn't even tell you. That's what the scripture says. So let it be of all things you guys establish in this house the revelation of the Father. And that comes by studying and becoming obsessive about the revelation of the love and the goodness of God. And I saw it in my spirit yesterday to the point that it moved me to tears. You guys will change the world if only you find his goodness and never leave it. Do not leave it. So tomorrow when you walk into work or you sit down at your laptop, maybe you work from home, maybe you're doing, you run your own business, let it be in your heart. Father, reveal your goodness today. Because it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And when the 12 Hebrew boys found that, they were able to change the world in just a matter of years. Thank you, Father. Father, we give you praise and glory. We thank you for your word which has gone forth, which has blessed all of us, myself included. Father, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. I know it took a pandemic to wake, awaken us again from our slumber as a church. But we're awake. And we hear your voice saying, arise and shine. Get up from the depression and the prostration which life circumstances have kept you. 
rise and shine with a new life. And then you say, darkness shall cover the earth. Indeed, great darkness shall cover the earth. And the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. Father, we choose your glory. We choose your goodness. We choose your love. From before the foundation of the world, your love chose us. And so in accordance with scripture, Father God, we love you because you loved us first. Let that be the greatest revelation in our hearts. Not just today, not just this week, but until we meet you in the skies. That we will never, ever take our eye off the flame of your love at the very centre of this ministry's existence. So Father, we enter into this new summer, a new thing created and birthed and propelled by your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.